All right, well, it is seven o'clock. So I think that we have the group. The group that is on time is gonna benefit from an on-time start. So I just wanna welcome all of you joining us today. I see some familiar names, people I know from Sudbury, from Espanola, from Timmins. Um, and I just have to say, thanks for joining us. Um, it's a pretty long list actually, people from Toronto, um, people from all over the north and all over the world really. So, and you know what, that actually is a very good reflection of kind of the student body that you might see at the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. So without further ado, I would like to officially kick us off. So first, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. We also further recognize that Laurentian University is located on the traditional lands of the Atikamekshing Anishinaabek, and that the city of Greater Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nation. As descendants of settlers, we extend our deepest respect to all Indigenous peoples. Now that is a land and treaty acknowledgement. I just wanted to point out the image on screen. You'll see that is the Laurentian University campus stretched out on those treaty lands. Oh, um, Leon, I'm not seeing the screen right now. Oh, well, thanks, Doug. <laughs> Let's fix that right away. All right, how is that? Good. Much better, right? Eh? Okay. Uh, for the benefit of uh, those that are uh, watching this later on replay, I'm sorry, but I'm going to start from the top. All right, welcome everyone to the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences um, a virtual open house. We're really glad to welcome you all today and we'll start with a treaty acknowledgement or land acknowledgement. Uh, we will begin by acknowledging the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. We also further recognize that Laurentian University is located on the traditional lands of the Atikamekshing Anishinaabek and that the city of Greater Sudbury includes the lands of the Wanapate First Nation. As descendants of settlers, we extend our deepest respect to all Indigenous peoples, which. Now, an overview of our agenda today. Um, we have a very broad audience here. Um, everybody uh, who might be in grade eight, just trying to figure out uh, what their, where their interest lies to professional geoscientists are on this webinar today. High school students, teachers, guidance counselors, welcome. Um, our agenda is broad so that we can share as much as we can and hit you at the level where you're at and inspire your passion for geoscience. So first off, we will go over our school and programs. We'll tell you a little bit about our location. We will give you an interactive and live virtual tour. We have our host standing by ready to begin that. We will also have a keynote mini lecture by our um, emeritus professor, um, Dr. Mike Lesher. Uh, we will also go over some research fields that you might want to pursue, talk about careers in geology and earth science, uh, scholarships, how to apply to our programs, and we want to let you know that we have a member of the Laurentian University liaison team standing by. Connor Koch is with us and he is ready to take any questions that you might have. Um, and we also have people online who are ready to take questions that are specific to geoscience or earth science programs, fields of study. Um, so please don't hesitate to use that chat. Uh, first, I've been talking for a, a little bit, a few minutes already. My name is Lynn Bullock and I'm the communications manager at the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences and the Mineral Exploration Research Center. Um, I have a wonderful job, as I was mentioning, it's amazing to come to work here every day and be among curious scientists and also among amazing rock samples. I love the earth, I love this planet, and I love exploring. Um, so if that's, if those are things that maybe spark your interest too, this might be a place that you want to spend a little more time. I'm going to hand it over to Doug now, our director, and he will introduce himself. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Doug Tinkham. I'm a faculty member here in the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. I'm currently the director of the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. Uh, my particular uh, area of research interest in earth sciences is what we call metamorphic petrology. 
I study what happens to rocks when they're buried tens of kilometers deep in the crust and they're heated up to hundreds of degrees Celsius until they reach the point that they start to melt. Um, and I just love uh, being here in Sudbury because we're surrounded by diverse geology and there's a ton of metamorphic rocks uh, around here. So this is a great place for metamorphic petrologists. All right, thank you, Doug. We'd like to turn it over to Tobias now who will lead our virtual tour. And he's also um, standing by in the hallway, Tobias. Good evening, Tobias Roth. I'm a geoscience technologist at the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences at Laurentian University. And on the side of my job, I actually like watching and playing soccer. I am an outdoors enthusiast and I love offering geological field trips through the Sudbury Basin. All right, thank you, Tobias. Um, now, we want to move along on our agenda and really expose you to how big earth science is as a field of study. Um, so, I mean, our question we ask people to try to understand, what do you understand about earth science is, what do you think it involves? And most students, when we ask them this question at a high school level, they come up with answers that are like, well, it involves rocks. It involves trees, they question. Um, and yes, actually, it can involve all of those things. When you think about earth science, think about our entire earth, think about our planetary systems, think about outer space because earth sciences now encapsulate our entire universe. Um, what does it take to study earth science? You actually need to have a very curious scientific mindset, but you don't need to be amazing at any one particular subject to take on this field of study at an undergraduate level. You need to be interested in rocks. You might, you might find strength in certain fields of study like chemistry, math, physics, biology, geography, history, even political science. You might be interested in any of those things, but you don't need to be an expert in any one. You might discover that one of those fields is your particular passion or area of expertise. Um, geoscientists around the world, many of them are focused on things like mineral exploration, but there are also many of them that are moving into um, kind of new technologies that are shaping the field, such as data science, um, 3D modeling, mapping has been around as part of geoscience since the very beginnings um, and GIS mapping is kind of a very important but also evolving field. Um, many people think of geologists and they think in our region, they think of, well, that's mining and it, not necessarily. It could also involve uh, looking at uh, the origins of the earliest forms of life on earth. Um, it could look at where there's signs of life on earth, a life on other planets. Um, and these are some of the things that our faculty members are exploring and doing breakthrough research on. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of how big a field of study this is. Um, and our director now, Doug Tinkham, will talk a little bit about some of the programs that we offer and how you can get engaged in this if this is a path you want to pursue. Doug? Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'd like to describe a little bit about our educational programs that we offer here in the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. We actually offer undergraduate uh, Bachelor of Science programs. Uh, we offer master's programs and PhD programs. I'll start with uh, our main Bachelor of Sciences program. This is a Earth Sciences program. It's pretty much a traditional geology uh, based program. Um, it's very thorough. Um, it's fairly intense uh, for a geology program, and one of the things that our program has is a strong field focus. Um, we live in the, in the Precambrian Shield. We're surrounded by great rocks, and we take the opportunity to get out and look at those rocks as much as we can. Um, our program is set to educate the students and get them ready for their career, whatever that career may be, um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, careers later. Um, but we ensure in our program that the students receive all of the knowledge requirements that are required to become registered as a professional geoscientist across Canada. Um, Canada has professional registrations for uh, geoscientists. And what we find is not all jobs in geology require um, a geologist to have a professional registration, but many do. And it's becoming more and more common 
for employers to seek out um, recent graduates who meet all of the knowledge requirements to gain uh, that professional registration. And that's one of the things that we ensure with our program. Uh, the courses that we offer, um, as I mentioned, are quite thorough, they're quite intense, and they make sure that you meet those knowledge requirements. We do not want to be graduating students from our program who get out in the real world and realize they don't have all of the education requirements that are required. So that's one of the things that we do um, in our particular program. Um, with that, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Lynn, if you don't mind. Um, I see a blank computer desktop. I've lost the power. <laughs> My mouse is uh, acting up. Here we are. Sorry, Deb. There we go. Um, we also offer uh, graduate programs, both the master's level and the PhD level. Our unit is quite heavy on the research side. Um, at the master's level, we offer three different streams within our master's of science and geology. Um, two of those streams are an applied or coursework based master's program, specifically in the area of mineral exploration. We offer two versions of those. Uh, we offer a one year coursework based applied MSc in mineral exploration. Uh, that's for students who come uh, and uh, take an intense set of courses, uh, eight courses a year. Um, and they get out with a master's degree in mineral exploration in one year. We also have a two-year version of that. Um, this is for students who are actually have full-time employment out in industry um, or with government, but they're full-time employed. And so we have a set of modular courses at, at, the, at the master's level. Students will come in and take these 10 to 12 day duration courses. Um, and in two years, um, they can have their master's degree and they can do all this while maintaining their employment. And then we also have the, the traditional research-based master's program. It's a two-year program. Students will come in, they'll take some of their coursework, but they'll be doing a lot of research, uh, pretty intensive on the research side, and they'll get a, a master's degree in two years in geology. We also offer a PhD program, and our PhD program is specifically in mineral deposits and Precambrian geology. It reflects um, the nature of geology in the region here. It reflects the nature of some of the expertise of some of our faculty, but not all of them. Um, and we offer PhD um, in basically all areas uh, of, the, of the geosciences. And that's a traditional three to four year based program research intensive. Um, and I, I think I'll leave it at that for the programs. Make sure if you have any specific questions on the programs, go ahead and ask them in the chat and I'll try to answer them uh, when I'm done here. Um, a little bit about um, the student experience once you arrive here at the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. As I said, we do pride ourselves on a field-based uh, program, uh, strong on the field side. Um, our students are quite active in this area and um, they go on a lot of field trips. And many of the, some of the field trips they arrange themselves, either through the Undergraduate Earth Sciences Club, or we have an LU Society of Economic Geology uh, chapter based here at Laurentian University. And the students are quite proactive in arranging um, international field trips. And of course, faculty will attend, some of the faculty will attend these field trips, um, but they try to take these field trips every year. Um, last year was um, a little bit different because of COVID, um, but we'll get back to, to these international level field trips as soon as we absolutely can. Um, Field-based learning. Uh, we live in the Precambrian Shield of Canada. We have a wide and diverse type of geology right within a driving distance of the university. In fact, we have some amazing geology right here on campus. Um, but within a half an hour drive, um, you can go and see sedimentary rocks, you can see high grade metamorphic rocks, you can see major igneous uh, intrusions with ore deposits associated with them. Um, we, you know, some rocks that are quite old, 2.7, 2.8 billion years old. Um, uh, within an hour drive, you can drive down to Manitoulin Island. Uh, see some uh, phanerozoic aged sedimentary rocks uh, with abundant fossils. So it's an absolutely fantastic place to see a wider range of geology uh, right here in our back door. Okay, Lynn. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, a little bit about job opportunities. Um, we're actually based, uh, Tobias is going to give a tour of our building here uh, in a few minutes, but we're actually based in a building that was built specifically for geosciences. Uh, in fact, uh, also based in our building is the Ontario Geological Survey. That's the main provincial level geological survey 
uh, for all of Ontario. Um, and so there's an interaction. Uh, we're in a very geology rich environment right here in the building. And also in town and in the surrounding region, there's a lot of uh, geological industry. There's a lot of, in, in Sudbury, there's a lot of mining activity. There's a lot of environmental geoscience activity that's going on. And so it's an absolutely great geological atmosphere. And if you want to immerse yourself in a geological atmosphere, I really don't know of a better place to do it. Um, throughout the year, um, once COVID is over, um, we'll have industry geologists coming into the building. Uh, they'll be participating in our seminars and the talks that our students give. Um, and with the Provincial Geological Survey here, it's an absolutely great opportunity. Now, there's a lot of job opportunities for our students in our programs. Um, with the government geoscientists right here in the building, um, with uh, all of the industry in town and with our, our field focus of our educational programs, what we find is the majority of our students between their second and third year of university and definitely between their third and the fourth year of university, they are all getting summer job experience. That summer job experience might be uh, field-based mapping research projects with some of our, our, our large research projects. Some of them are working in the mineral exploration industry um, throughout Canada and even throughout the world um, doing various things. Uh, sometimes they're out mapping, sometimes they're in the core shack, logging drill core, working on a deposit. Uh, sometimes they're collecting water samples for more you know, environmental focused studies associated with mining. And um, some of the students will get hired on as field assistants with the Provincial Geological Survey. And they might be going out and they'll have a full summer of field mapping experience uh, sometimes helicopter-based, working in remote areas, sometimes in northern Canada. And, and so even, you know, the job opportunities are really picking up right now. It's a really hot market. And in fact, several of our students between first and second year of university this past summer, they had summer jobs and they, they got great experience working out there in the summer. You know, they'd only had their two introductory geologies and some of their other introductory courses, and they were already being hired as geologists to work in the summer. So that's something you can expect here from job opportunities. Lynn? Right. Our next slide is, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our location. So some of you online have no doubt been to Sudbury because you live in nearby areas where you're from here. Um, but something to mention about Sudbury, if you don't know, is that it's one of the most important um, and resource rich mining camps in the world. And not only that, the technology and all of the um, innovation that occurs right here in Sudbury is another reason why the world looks to this place and to our school um, as, a, as really a hub of mining innovation, research, um, and of course resources. Um, the other neat thing, as you can see through, from these photos, is that um, we're surrounded by beautiful lakes, beautiful um, trees, forests, um, and you can see the Laurentian University campus in the center, the athletic facilities on the far right. Um, there's a golf course on the left, um, and you can see also that shiny building in these uh, two photos on the far left and right. That is our Willett Green Miller Center that Doug has told you about um, all of the amazing uh, geological research that occurs inside. Uh, and the work done by um, government geoscientists as well. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Tobias, who's going to give you an inside look of the school. So Tobias. Hello, uh, so my role be, will be at um, the Willett Green Miller Center to give you a tour of the fifth and the eighth floors. And I'll start at the um, main area. I will uh, walk with my, uh, camera face um, the other way around. Uh, when you first come to the fifth floor, we um, go to the Hartwell School of Earth Sciences Administration. And down the hallway, we have several classrooms. These are not the only classrooms that we uh, occupy, but um, we have uh, one classroom that's the Jim Davis Economic Geology Lab that is currently occupied by our students. And um, I will ask a few students a few questions here. Uh, it's going to be a, a very busy laboratory here because there's exam time. And uh, I'm just going to ask Cole, if you don't mind. Hi, Cole. How are you? You're doing well. So you are on camera and you, ha you have the sound on. So let uh, explain to um, the audience 
what are you guys doing in this laboratory? So we're uh, studying for a mineralogy uh, lab exam. Uh, basically, in our uh, lab exam, we're given a sample uh, of an assemblage of minerals, and we have to identify the different minerals within it. So that's very good. So, uh, Cole, where are you from, actually? I'm from Kitchener, Ontario. So a little more south than here, but you know, I like it up here. All right, and you're currently in which year? Um, I'm currently second year. Okay, thank you very much, Cole. So we'll go through the uh, classroom. Tomorrow is the exam time, I heard. And uh, we'll just pass through the other door. Thank you. So in our other hallways, uh, we have um, more laboratories. Uh, there's going to be a focus on economic geology. So we have a fluid inclusions laboratory. Uh, we also have uh, ore deposits and volcanology. Uh, many, many displays of minerals around the world. And uh, as I walk through here, where the hallways lined with other laboratories that are including the um, igneous petrology and um, right uh, next to me here is a small room that our graduate students are able to book to um, do research and take pictures of their thin sections and other rock specimens. So we've got some of these microscopes. So we call this the photography lab. And uh, you can see some very colorful thin section in here. And very shortly, I will also introduce uh, Doug, who was uh, telling us about one of his thin sections. So um, the next room will be um, the microscope teaching laboratory. And in the microscope teaching laboratory, there are several, co several courses taking place. So I am arrived just here. And uh, Cole made sure that the lights are on. So in here we have uh, 25 different microscopes. They're called petrographic microscopes. And our students can um, learn at their individual microscope. But um, I will go to Doug and uh, he will tell us about a thin section that he has placed under the microscope. Okay. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you what, how we make the thin section. We go out, we collect the rock like this, we end up cutting it into a little chip like this. And then we take a microscope glass slide and we glue it to that microscope glass slide. And then we grind it down. We grind it down until that rock is only 30 microns in thickness. And at that thickness, we can put it under a polarizing light microscope and we pass light through it. And at that thickness, light can actually penetrate through the minerals and we can start to use the optical properties of minerals to identify them and to identify microscopic textures that help us tell us about the history of the rock. Now, Cole, can you hit the lights real quick? Um, this is just a, a random thin section I grabbed. It's a metamorphic rock. Um, and we're looking down and the field of view here is probably about one millimeter in width. So we're looking at things at the microscopic scale. And you can't see all the details, but I just wanna show you some of the things we might look at. When I look at this rock, Overall, it has a fabric like this, and I see these brown minerals. These are platy minerals called biotite. And that tells me that all the biotites are aligned. And that means that this rock was deformed. It was squeezed at some point in time, and all these minerals grew aligned to one another. Now, me as a metamorphic petrologist, I use information here to identify the minerals. Some of the other minerals we have are starlight. There's a few of these sort of yellowish starlights here. And this is a mineral uh, that's called uh, andalusite. And I look at the microscopic textures and relationships. And when I look at this, I can see that these starlights might be hard for you to see, but it actually overgrows this planar fabric. And that tells me that this rock was deformed before the starlight grew. And I apply thermodynamics to the rocks. I look at the mineral chemistry and the relationships, and I can try to determine at what pressures and temperatures that rock grew. And we'll be done with the slideshow there. And what I can do determined, it's back, is that these starlights grew probably around 625 to 653 Celsius. And they probably grew when they were probably about 15 kilometers deep in the crust. So using microscopic information and applying some techniques, I can tell you this rock was deformed before it reached 625 degrees C, and then it was heated up um, at about 15 kilometers depth. And these are some of the things you'll learn uh, when looking through microscopes. And this is just one small example of what you can learn 
using a microscope, though there's many, many examples. But I'll leave it at that in the sake of time. Uh, I have to let uh, Tobias get on with the virtual tour. Okay, thank you very much, Doug. That's very fascinating to look at a thin section of rock to study all the details that are lying within and within, uh, within the geological history. So I'm leaving the microscopy lab and I'm heading towards the elevator. So while I'm in the elevator, um, maybe Lynn, you can tell the audience about the other floors that uh, we're using. So I will be muted for now. Absolutely. So thank you for that, Tobias. Um, you mentioned uh, talking about some of the other floors. Um, I might actually ask Doug to touch base on the basement of our building. Doug, can you uh, describe what's down there? Oh, I forgot. I don't think Doug is back. He's in away his from the computer. Yet. Okay. So in the basement of our building, so you walk in on the main floor. Thanks, Tobias. You can ride, ride on, but on the main floor, um, you walk in. But if you go downstairs, we have a lab that has all kinds of machines that are actually for cutting rocks, cutting thin sections, cutting samples. Um, and in that, in that lab, there's a lot of uh, technology and equipment um, that later, later on in their careers, students get to learn how to use. Um, but when you first start out, it can be a bit, uh, a little bit dangerous. So we have a technician that helps. Um, on the eighth floor, way up at the top, which is where I work, the view is amazing. Sometimes I see bald eagles. Um, uh, but on the eighth floor is the Mineral Exploration Research Center. And actually, I think I can hear Tobias beeping in the elevator. So he should be arriving soon. Um, there he is. Nice I can continue with my tour. <laughs> That's right. So on the eighth floor, we also have um, one of the prizes. I wanted to show you um, before we, um, I have uh, mentioned it before and we have announced it on Instagram that we have these Minecraft inspired rock collection boxes for you to win as our audience tonight. So um, pay attention to um, the, the trivia facts that we have uh, in our presentation. Uh, including Dr. Michael Lesher's presentations la later on. So we'll ask you about um, certain facts in the chat later on. And when you are the first person to respond, will win one of these Minecraft inspired boxes that includes a uh, challenge to identify the rocks that are in the box. So these are of course the real rocks, but their names will be recognized by you guys from um, the game of Minecraft. So on the eighth floor, um, we're going into the student lounge. This is called the seminar room in which uh, we use as a study space currently. And um, before the pandemic hit, we had um, gatherings in here with our students and professors, coffee time. And it was um, a great room with a view, which is not possible at night, but we can see Ramsey Lake out these windows so it's a great um, room for everybody to um, meet and have a good time when it's um, about to have, when we have time for breaks. I'm walking by um, the uh, Merck office, which is called the Mineral Exploration Research Center. And um, the next room I have is the paleontology lab. And I have to trigger the lights on first. So um, the paleontology lab, is rich with the history of the earth. So we have fossils from all around the world, from all ages. And I have three examples on the table that I want to speak to you about. So um, the recent news coming out of paleontology at the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences is that our professor, Dr. Elizabeth Turner, published this year a major publication finding supposedly the oldest animal life ever found on the planet. So um, that is likely a sponge that uh, was published in Nature. And uh, we're very proud of this achievement. It was internationally covered in the media. And uh, I will just show you a couple of details, fossils that we have in this labs. And we're starting with the earliest one. This is called a stromatolite. And uh, these stromatolites were cyanobacteria. So microorganisms that were able to trap sediments and make these wavy structures that you see 
um, as layers over here. So this is from the Proterozoic Eon. These cyanobacteria were making oxygen that we are um, breathing today at the time when these started to evolve. The cyanobacteria evolved. Um, there wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere, but these microorganisms were able to provide that and uh, accumulate oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, the three fossils that I have here are all uh, from the ocean. So life started out in the ocean. And uh, further on in time, we're going to the Cambrian period where we had early reef builders. So think of the Great Barrier Reef where you have corals and very colorful biodiversity. Um, in here, these are the earliest reef builders, likely also sponges that um, existed in the Cambrian period and they're called archaeocyathids. So um, later on, when reefs became evolved more and something that is much, much closer to here and some people are in the audience are from Manitoulin. I, I uh, realized looking at the chat. So here we have a colonial coral from Manitoulin Island and this is from the Fordovician period. So you can see um, these have certain shapes They're also nicknamed the honeycomb coral. So over here, you can see that honeycomb shape. And this is something that is um, in the Ordovician time where biodiversity was much vaster than it is right now. So, and later on in the evolution of life, we of course have mammals. For example, this skull from the muskox or a baleen of a whale over here. So I'm leaving the paleontology lab and um, we'll go to the last of our labs where we have Gabrielle waiting for us. And um, Gabrielle is prepared to speak about why structural geology is important. So this is called the structural geology lab. And here we have Gabrielle. Thank you for waiting for our audience. So we are live with uh, many, many people right now. And uh, I've just introduced you as a structural geology student. So um, you're, um, you're, you're doing a master's. Yeah. And please, please tell us um, your name again and uh, where you're from. Sure. So my name is Gabrielle Colliard, and I'm a master's student focusing on structural geology. And today I just want to tell you a little bit about what structural geology is. So it's the, um, it is a study of how rocks move when they're put under pressure. And there's many different factors that influence how these rocks are going to react. And uh, so if a rock is very cold and very hard, it's going to break and it's going to move in small sections. But if a rock is very soft and very warm, it's actually going to form uh, some bends. And this is what we're seeing in this rock here. These are actually called folds. And structural geology is important for many reasons. It helps geologists find precious metals and important minerals. It helps architects find stable ground to build skyscrapers and roads and airports. You can also use it to help find water underground. And that can be useful in you know, arid regions where there's not a lot of water on the surface. So structural geology is really important. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. That was great. So uh, we're Visited, we have visited all our laboratories now, and um, I can conclude my tour. Thank you very much again. Um, and I'll give it over to Lynn. So I will go back to my office and uh, we'll look at asking you a couple of questions in the chat. Lynn, you're muted. Thank you very much, Tobias. I noticed I was muted because he was walking by my office, so we didn't want to have any uh, feedback there. Um, I just want to say thank you, Tobias, and also thank you to all of our students who took time uh, out of their night uh, this evening to be with us and share their passion for their, for their area of study. Gabrielle is doing some amazing work um, and a great example of what you can do um, pursuing a master's degree with us, um, and as well, you met a number of our um, a number of our Bachelor of Science students. So at this point, I am actually going to give up control to 
um, our keynote speaker who will be able to advance some slides. Mike, if you'd like to take control, you can move the slides through. And in the meantime, while you're preparing for that, um, Doug is ready to give you a warm introduction. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for sticking with us for the through the webinar. Um, we're very lucky today. We're going to have a mini uh, lecture here on the geology of Sudbury, and I'm I'm very ha happy to introduce um, one of our faculty members here in the department, Dr. Mike Lesher. And just give you a little bit of history on Mike Lesher. Um, Mike arrived at Laurentian University, I believe, in 1994. Um, and he arrived as an insert research chair in mineral exploration. And that was the first research chair uh, that Laurentian University had. Um, he later went on to, to become a university research chair in acknowledgement um, all, of all of the contributions that he's made to Laurentian University um, over the years. And he's currently a professor emeritus within the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences. Um, Mike uh, leads large research programs. He's leading very large research programs right now, funded by industry, funded by um, NSERC, which is a federal granting agency. Um, and in fact, um, he's supervising many graduate students, and he actually has a very large research program going on right now in Sudbury with several uh, PhD students and graduate students. And so there's really uh, nobody better to give this lecture. Um, and so I'm very happy to introduce Mike. Um, and I will let him take it away and give the mini lecture. Thanks, Doug. Um, Lynn, I think you're going to have to advance the slides. I'm having trouble on my end. You want to give it one more shot to see if you can get the cursor so that you have your professor's pointer, because I know that will make it. Um, yeah, it says I've got control, but it's actually not um, letting it only me gives you keyboard do anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, wait a minute. Here we go. Oh, oh you've got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, now hopefully my up and down arrow keys will work. Yeah, good. Okay, we're all set. So, um, so I'm, I just thought you guys might be interested in hearing a little bit about Sudbury, uh, the impact structure. Uh, the uh, We could talk about the ores. Uh, another time, but uh, the impact structure is actually quite interesting and that's what uh, made the ores. So this is a, um, of course, a, a Google Earth view of the Sudbury Basin, which has an outline sort of like this. And so Levac is up here. There's a lot of mines up in this area and you can see the labels of some of these other places. And uh, Laurentian is right down here uh, in between Nefawan and Ramsey Lakes. And so the Nephilim Beach, the University Beach is right there. And um, so you can see it's elliptical. We'll talk to why that's the case in a second. And you can see that there's a big lake up here that's rounded. Turns out that uh, the Sudbury Basin, as you can gather from the name, has been formed by a large uh, extraterrestrial bolide, uh, as it's called, came in and, and hit this area. Uh, but that happened also over here. So this is a place where two meteorites almost hit on top of each other. And uh, when we get to the end, I'll, we'll talk about the odds of that happening to us again. So um, Sudbury is one of the world's largest, oldest, and best exposed. It's not quite the largest. Uh, Fredafort in South Africa uh, has, uh, has that honor, but we're very close. Um, it's 1.85 billion years old which is about two thirds the age of the earth. So back when there were a lot more meteorite impacts uh, than there are now, it's now 60 kilometers by 27 kilometers, but that's just what's been exposed. It was originally circular with a much larger diameter, but of course, since then it got glaciated along with everything else in, in the uh, Northern part of North America. We think it formed by either a 10 kilometer asteroid or a 15 kilometer uh, diameter comet. And the difference is, is that asteroids are denser, um, but generally a little bit slower because they're just came in, coming from the asteroid belt. Uh, but comets, which travel around much greater distances and get um, slingshotted by uh, some of the larger objects in the solar system, including the sun, um, are much faster. 
Um, and, and it turns out that this is still an area in active research that we're not sure about. Uh, the Wanapate structure, which I'm not gonna talk about, is only 37 million years old and it's much smaller. In fact, the impact crater is entirely within the lake and, and, and isn't evident um, on the surface. So um, my little ellipse here has uh, gone wrong, but that's the size of Wanapate up here. There's the Sudbury structure. You can see some of the environmental damage from the old, old, old days where they used to just burn the ore. And uh, so this is that, uh, basically the same image we saw, but showing the scale of it relative to Lake Nipissing and Georgian Bay. Um, so um, just a few things about impacts. So unless they're really small, uh, the uh, meteorites or uh, what's the particulate matter that's in comets are usually completely vaporized. So we don't uh, see them. And as I mentioned, it may be an asteroid or a comet. And um, well, the process involves uh, impact, of course, an excavation phase that I'll show schematically in a second, um, a rebound phase, and then a collapse phase. And all that happens in seconds to minutes. And uh, my slides seem to be moving on their own. Um, let's try that again. Well, I guess we'll skip that. So um, the stages are shown here sort of schematically. And the first thing that happened is, is that the impactor vaporizes and it forms what's called a transient cavity. And that's because it doesn't last very long. And what's important is it also forms this green layer that is an impact melt. And some of that actually gets injected down into the underlying rocks. And we'll see that uh, um, in a minute. Uh, the next step is, is that because this is gravitationally unstable, we've just pushed down very hard on the Earth. So the Earth pushes back. Uh, this is what happens when glaciers pile up on the Earth too. And uh, the area we're in is still rebounding um, from the melting of the glaciers because that's a slow process. This is much faster and you form a central peak in here, but then that's also gravitationally unstable. So things are bouncing back and forth. It collapses, generates a lot of debris, and we uh, inject more material into the dikes, and we end up with a big impact melt sheet, like a big lava lake. In this case, um, a, a couple hundred kilometers or uh, 260 kilometers wide. So I think I have to click on this little thing again. Sorry, I lost control at one point. There we go. Um, the end result here, is what we see now. There's a little bit of geology on here, which I'll, I've kept really simple. Um, the, the basin is bowl-shaped because it was um, basically slightly bowl-shaped to start with, and then it got pushed through structural processes, uh, like was described earlier, from this direction and turned it from being circular into elliptical. And so what we see then is, is that the layers are exposed around the outside um, around the periphery, just like if you were to bend a pie or a cake and then, and then have a slice through it. The rocks up here are granites and gneisses, you know, and, uh, and down here, what we call green stones and gabbros, so dark greenish sort of rocks in here. And there's uh, a layer of fallback breccia, so some of the stuff that, that goes up in the impact comes back down on top. And then the melt sheet I mentioned is this pink layer, and those dikes I mentioned are these things that stick out here. And some of them are radial, they extend off away from the Sudbury Igneous Complex, and some of them are concentric around here. This is where the ores are, and I'm not gonna talk much about the ores because I think the impact's probably the more interesting thing uh, right now. But if we look at the outer part of that melt sheet, then the ores actually sit down in little depressions and little troughs at the bottom. And, uh, and, and some of them are in the dikes and some of them are on the contact of, of that layer. Um, I guess there must be probably a couple hundred billion tons of ore in Sudbury. Uh, and that's just down to where we can, we can see it at this particular point, it keeps going down. And uh, the last calculation I saw that it was worth somewhere, well, any one of these larger ore bodies is worth 
something like a hundred billion dollars. So each one, a hundred billion dollars. So that's why Sudbury has been operating such a long time and why the mines are so deep. Um, just some of the jolly that's interesting. So this is one of those dikes and the dikes are really interesting. This is unusual. No other uh, impact site on earth has this. And that is the dikes have two phases. They have an outer phase that's very fine grain. It basically chills. So this was molten rock and it chilled against the country rocks, which are over uh, just out of view right here. And then shortly after that, another phase came in but it actually ripped up pieces of that. You can see a clast of that, of this material now inside the rest of this. And this material is just full of lots of little inclusions, some of which are from the country rocks, some of which are from this margin, and some of which are from the connection back up to the, um, the, uh, the Sudbury Igneous Complex. If we look uh, in other areas, you can see these nice radiating pyroxenes. And these textures and the, the fine margin that we saw before are caused by really rapid cooling. So this was super hot. In fact, we call it superheated uh, because it didn't have any crystals in it. And then when it solidifies, because there were no nuclei left in the, uh, the melt for which to start crystallizing things, then it has a very delayed crystallization. When it goes, it's like the ice uh, crystals on a pond and grows these very narrow crystals. Um, I'm sure you've all seen that skating um, on the ice. So what are the shock effects? Well, this is a plot of temperature against pressure. And these are the areas that Doug Tinkham works on. Normal metamorphic rocks, even with the very, very, very deep ones, uh, only get up to these sorts of pressures and temperatures. This is gigapascals. Um, uh, that's not my area, so I can't convert that to something. But anyway, this would be 30 kilometers down or more um, in, in, in the crust. And shock metamorphism is way over here. It's completely different. And we get shatter cones, which I'll show you some of. Planar deformation features, I'll show you some of those. Um, basically, melted minerals that turn to glass. Um, I'll skip over that. And, uh, and in the end, we melt the rocks and the whole Sudbury igneous complex was a melt. And this shows the distributions of some of those things I mentioned. We have impact breccias, which I'll show you that extend out this far all the way over to Lake Tomogamy, uh, for example, there's a scale down here, 20 kilometers. Shatter cones uh, have a limited uh, extent around here. They basically circle Sudbury, the planar deformation features are uh, a little bit tighter in here, a little further out there. And there are even impact diamonds in some places. I'll show you those. And finally, recently discovered, oddly enough, uh, is distal impact ejecta, material that got blown all the way over into the upper peninsula of Michigan and Thunder Bay. This is Sudbury Breccia, and this is a Breccia formed by impact. And this black rock is super fine grained, uh, so fine you really can't even see anything under the microscope. And it is basically, it's not a melted version, but it's a super pulverized version of all these other rocks that are in here. So this is a granite, and that has exactly the same composition if you analyze it chemically. And it's just been, had a shock wave go through it from the impact and turned all that uh, into ground up pulverized rock flour uh, that then uh, formed this black material. These are shatter cones. You can see they have an apex here that radiate out and they're actually nested cones. So there are cones within cones within cones. Uh, these point down, uh, indicating that in this area, we prefer, preserve the original orientation and the impact hit here and the shock wave went through and made these nested cones. And there's uh, probably, um, I guess, the second best examples in the whole Sudbury Basin are just down the road from the Willagree Miller Center on Ramsey Lake Road. These are what the planar deformation lamellae look like. They're actually uh, called decorated uh, inclusion trails that go along here. And so these are little fractures that develop in the rock. This is quartz, which uh, can be very clear. 
um, or at least uh, white without these sort of features in it. Now it's got all these fracture planes. And these are the impact diamonds, which I'm showing you just because they're kind of interesting um, that they're diamonds. They're very ugly. Um, nobody would want these diamonds, but they're evidence of very, very, very high pressure, which you wouldn't normally find on, 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 on the surface of the earth, except in a kimberlite pipe, which is where we mine impact diamonds. The distal impact ejecta. So here's Sudbury in the middle of this uh, thing here. And they're found over here, like I said, in Thunder Bay and uh, around in Minnesota and in the upper peninsula of, uh, of, uh, of Michigan. And um, uh, well, a lot of us have been on field trips to look at them in the field. This is what they look like. Uh, they actually form what are called lapilli, which are these uh, concentric structures here that sort of grow like, um, like a snowball uh, as they're traveling and contain all sorts of fractured uh, bits of rock that were used to be parts of Sudbury. So these are uh, would be same as volcanic rocks. The difference with these is, is something I'll show you in a second, and their chemistry, which is uh, unique for meteorite impacts in terms of containing uh, iridium and other platinum group elements. Uh, these are the um, planar deformation uh, features that are in some of those crystals. And of course, these are exactly like the ones we just saw that are in, uh, in, in parts of Sudbury. So what is a, how does a crater form and what's it look like? Well, big craters uh, are actually pretty flat and uh, they have these uh, little uh, grobbins on the side, uh, we call them with these faults that tip down in these directions. The melt sheet uh, sits in here like this and there's a collapsed central uplift that, that we saw. And so I just wanna show you now to finish up is how we estimated how big Sudbury is. And this was done by uh, Hayden Butler and John Spray. And uh, we, they deduced it basically from field observations. So the extent of those things we've seen, shatter cones, asset dikes, and, and impact brexia, and the empirical uh, square root of two proportional spacing of the distributions of those features based on Venusian craters. And you might wonder, well, why do we do that on Venus? Well, it turns out Venus has a similar mass as Earth. And so the behavior of the gravity and, and the way the meteorite impact will form will be similar um, as on Earth. And because Venus hasn't been turned over by plate tectonics going on all the time, the craters are much better exposed on Venus. They're even better exposed on Mars, but Mars has a small mass, so we can't use that. And they're superbly exposed on the moon, of course, but of course it has a very small mass. So anyway, um, the, the first ring they identified was where that large concentric dike occurs. That's called the Hess offset dike. And that has um, a diameter that, I'll, that we'll get back to in just a second. But anyway, that occurs along here. So they identified that as the, uh, as the original um, sort of transient cavity and the, one of the first outer bounding faults, uh, basically. We'll see that in a second. Um, the next ring they identified is the limit of demagnetization of the Metachuan dike swarm. So this is a dike swarm that extends all the way up to the northernmost part of Canada. And dikes are vertical structures. Uh, they're basically igneous rocks that came up. They may have fed big volcanoes at the top, but that's all been eroded. And they can be maybe tens of meters, well, and sometimes just a meter wide. And they, they're mapped out magnetically. Uh, because they're magnetic. And you can see these are all, so these are real things. This is not schematic. These are mapped Metachuan dikes. And you can see they all end, except they don't end. <laughs> around Sudbury, we see them all around Sudbury. What's happened is, is, is that when that impact melt sheet was present, it demagnetized all the rocks. It raised them above what we call the Curie temperature. And that also corresponds to the end of the foy offset dike, which is the one that extends the furthest from the Sudbury income, igneous complex. So that tells us how big the impact melt sheet was. Okay, next ring. Well, this was mapped by John Spray and, um, and one of his students, Lucy Thompson, and they identified a zone uh, concentration of fault breccia. So not 
not Sudbury breccia that sort of just pervaded the rocks, but breccia that form by movement of rocks against each other. That's the brittle kind of faulting uh, that was talked about uh, in, in, in the structure lab. And there's a concentration of that around here. And so that, that's sort of the outer part of, of some of those ring faults. And then finally, they did a final rim calculation uh, based on the square root of two relationship. So that's inferred because that's not obvious and it's all been completely eroded. So they end up with then, oh, I guess I didn't stick that slide back in, then that circular structure uh, that we saw. So that's how we know how large Sudbury is, which puts it on this diagram, which is the last slide, in terms of the size of the impactor, and this is a log scale, okay? So this is 80 miles up here or 80, oh, sorry, no, this is millions of megatons on here. Sorry, I need to blow this up. I've got a small on my screen. And, um, and so the impactor size here is, uh, as, we, as we discussed, about 10 kilometers. This is meters in here. So these are the very largest impacts. Chuxalub, the one that hit the Yucatan Peninsula is down here. And that's equivalent to 96, uh, is that million megatons, if that makes sense of TNT. And uh, here's the good news though, that only happens once every 100 or maybe 500 million years. So we're pretty safe from that happening again. The reason we got hit by the smaller one at Wanapate is those sort of impacts are more frequently. Anyway, I think we're quite safe that we won't be hit again in our lifetimes. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions later if there's time for that, but I, I hope that's all okay. And I guess I'll release control. To... I think I've taken it. Good. Um, Mike, if I could hand you a prize, I have an amazing sample of Sudbury ore right here. Oh but you might already have this one. Um, I just have to say thank you so much. And I think everybody on uh, everybody online today got an incredible picture of the depth of research that geologists do and how we understand our earth, how we understand our universe, the math we use, the, the incredible curiosity it takes to solve these problems. So thank you, Mike, that was, just amazing to learn about the Sudbury impact structure, places that I've seen with my own eyes but never imagined what it took to make that happen. The well, that, that's, that's the simplest part of the story you could get. The, uh, the great thing about Sudbury is, is that it was so complex and so unique that, that there's still research being done now hundreds of years later, so yeah. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. And I, I hope uh, I hope people stay online and Mike will be here to answer any of your specific questions about that as he is a world expert on this subject. Now, moving along for people that might be curious about what a career in earth science or geoscience might mean for them, um, I'd like to kind of show you again, the broad fields of study, the, the broad choices that you have um, if you wanted to become a professional geologist uh, and pursue that as uh, something you commit the rest of your life to. Um, there are 20,000 geoscientists in Canada. Um, you may not see them walking around. There are not primetime TV shows about geologists, uh, like there are paramedics or forensic scientists. But geoscientists are out there um, exploring the earth, teaching us about our earth, helping us to understand how to live here safely, how to mine safely. Um, and I have to tell you that for years, there have been more jobs available for geologists than there have been geologists to fill them. Um, industry partners with the Mineral Exploration Research Center um, and also, our graduates who are running companies come to our school every year and say, can you please send us your students? We need students to fill jobs. Um, it is a trend every summer. Um, 
all of our students who wanted to work in the field before they graduated this past summer did so. Um, some of these students were out working in pretty remote locations doing frankly pretty tough jobs, um, roughing it in the bush, uh, working in um, Western British Columbia, for example, um, but they earned $400 a day in some cases, which is kind of unimaginable when you're thinking about how a student pay uh, usually goes in summer jobs. Uh, we did touch on that as part of your student experience uh, earlier in the presentation, so I won't go into it too much more except to say other students and professional geologists, because your student jobs often are just the beginning of your career, and then you can pursue kind of what, find out what you like and what you don't like. Um, but you can pursue that later, but you can decide, you know, maybe I don't want a job where I'm outdoors a lot. Maybe I prefer a job where I'm indoors a lot, maybe grappling with uh, large amounts of data, um, doing computer 3D modeling, um, trying to communicate data uh, or working as part of a team um, on a mine site where you might, you know, you might get to live in a beautiful place like Sudbury or Trail British Columbia, just as an example. Um, but many of these jobs um, have become even work from home jobs. So if that's something that appeals for you, appeals to you, um, it's an option. I mean, if there's a bottom line that I hope you take from this and this slide, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of go through our little honeycomb shapes here. Um, but if there's a bottom line I want you to take home, it's that choosing to study earth sciences means you have a lot of choices before you. Um, you could go into diverse fields such as paleontology, mineral exploration, hydrogeology. Um, you, you could work in a laboratory. Um, you could be a person who is helping us to determine when a natural disaster might strike or where there's high risk levels for things to occur like um, earthquakes, volcanoes, flooding, landslides. Um, when we think about what's going on with climate change, and climate disasters around the world and in Canada right now, you can see there's a big need for that. Um, you might work with government, you might work with, in, with industry. And we've also got um, some very success, successful graduates of our program who've start their, started their own consultancy firms and also ones who really uh, reached kind of the top 1% of society. Uh, they, may be, uh, they may be running, um, or have executive roles on some of the biggest um, mining companies in the world. So I must say, um, you've got a lot of choices and our professors are always ready to help you talk about though, talk about your choices. And we have many um, graduates too uh, that can help you walk, walk you through those, some of those career options available to you. And again, if you have questions about these things, um, Go ahead and ask them in the chat. I know the chat's very active right now uh, with a little trivia competition going on um, that Tobias is running. Um, mentioning kind of how lucrative things can be for you if you decide to choose to study at our school uh, in terms of your summer student employment, another, um, another excellent opportunity we have for you, which is really funded by um, the Harquill family, um, is an amazing scholarship program. So for students that apply to our program um, and meet the requirements, so students coming in in January of 2022, that's just you know, next month, or students coming in September, um, you I really have to encourage you to apply by uh, January 13th. That's the equal consideration deadline. I'll get to that later. Um, but also apply to the scholarships available. This one is unique to our school, but across um, the geosciences. There are many, many industry scholarships that our students qualify for, as well as academic uh, merit-based scholarships offered by different agencies and organizations. This one I really need to flag, because if you're considering applying to our program and starting in January or in September, um, definitely apply if you have the grades to make the cut. Um, Laurentian as well, um, has very generous financial aid um, packages, um, basically academic excellence scholarships for students. So you can see on this chart where you might fit in, 
um, that really helps defray the cost of obtaining a university education. So depending on where you land, definitely apply for these uh, after you apply and, and accept your offer from the school. So um, this is just kind of an excellent chart to show you how much money the university will, will offer you based on your academic merit. Now you may be wondering if you're on this call, if you're with us and you, and you are thinking about applying, well, what do I need? Do I have the grades to even get into your school? Well, for Ontario high school students, this slide is for you. You need one grade 12 English, university level uh, or regular course. You need one grade 12 advanced functions. You need a grade 12 science course. You need a grade 12 math or science course in addition to that one and two other grade 12 um, courses. So overall, you need a minimum average of 70% in your six best grade 12 courses. Um, and you can get all of these details because I'm summarizing to save on time for those who are not quite yet, yet ready to apply or maybe they're actually international students. Um, you can find all of these details or be sure to um, just, just message us because um, we do know that the requirements change uh, depending on what your situation is. If you're international, a graduate student, um, or maybe not from Ontario. Um, again, this January 13th deadline that I mentioned with respect to the Harkwell Scholarship, that is um, the equal consideration deadline for Ontario um, school, for Ontario high school students. I see Connor is helping me out as well, explaining the, um, the courses required. Thanks, Connor. Um, so definitely you wanna apply by that date. Um, and then I've listed March 1st, uh, for those of you that are that have excellent grades, more than 80% average, you definitely want to apply for that Harkwell BSc scholarship at five grand. Um, it's a very generous, it's going to cover almost all of your tuition and fees for first year. And we offer multiple um, Harkwell scholarships. So your odds of getting one if you have those grades are, are much better than the lottery uh, and also far better than the odds of Sudbury being hit by another um, impact uh, event. So um, just putting things in perspective. Okay. Uh, finally, um, our liaison team at Laurentian is always ready to answer any questions you have. And I know there was someone on this uh, webinar earlier tonight that had, was wondering about um, residence opportunities and what were the COVID protocols that the residents had put in place for students here. Um, We'll keep our focus tonight mainly to geoscience, geology, earth science topics, but Laurentian is always ready to respond to those kinds of questions. So you can email them at info.laurentian.ca, uh, phone them, um, and definitely a web, the website is a great place to start. Um, wrapping things up, just a few facts you may not know about Laurentian University. Um, it's among the very top in on, among Ontario universities for post-graduation rates and has been for ages and ages. So 94% of Laurentian University graduates find meaningful employment within six months. And I would, hmm, I'd bet you 10, 10 bucks, no, I bet you 100 bucks that um, that stat is even higher in the past five years for the graduates of our school. Um, for Laurentian University, uh, we're number one in the province of all Ontario universities for the highest salary outcomes. So many of the programs at Laurentian have very um, excellent, uh, your, your earnings potential is very, is very good. Let me put it that way. Um, and our, our school is among those. So earth science um, professional geoscientists. When you graduate from our program, you can become part of a registered profession, just like an engineer or a doctor does. Um, so that should tell you that, yes, you are going to be finishing up your education um, and have some solid um, earnings potential and also a very solid background, um, be ready to take on the world. So I guess we're ready to wrap up I can see the trivia game is still going on in the chat. Um, and I just wanted to kind of throw it out there. If anybody had any questions, 
about earth sciences, question for uh, Dr. Lesher and on the impact structure. I mean, he, you know, he has a lot of knowledge to share um, or if anybody is still online with specific questions that they might wanna pose to our director, um, Doug Tinkham um, or Connor from Liaison. Um, now's the time um, we can actually enable your ability to to talk if you'd like to, but you can put your question in the chat as well. Oh, well, thank you, Lynn. That was great. Um, I have uh, one last question to for the trivia game for the Minecraft inspired uh, rock collection boxes. And it will be name another rock found in Sudbury that is the evidence of an impact. So far, we have um, had answers like shadow cones, and that was correct. But there were a couple of others that uh, Dr. Michael Lesher had mentioned. So I'm just going to type that last question into the chat. So far, we have 10 winners. Congratulations, everybody. And uh, we will email you to ask you for your, um, how we get this box to you. So look for your email uh, tomorrow. It was hard for me to resist shouting out answers. So <laughs> competitive. To hear. Um, there's another question in there from Jill. Um, Jill Beer is asking, how deep is the impact structure in the Sudbury Basin? Yeah, I was just going to type that in, but it's quick, quicker just to answer. Um, well, it's been deformed, so the 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 side that, that faces south has sort of been squished up. So the the actual current depth of it, uh, the structure is about ten kilometers. We know that by uh, looking at uh, what we call seismic information, where we put uh, energy into the ground and that energy goes down or reflects off of the layers. Uh, that's how they find. Uh, some mineral deposits, certainly petroleum deposits. And, uh, but the, what's more pertinent is, is what the thickness of the impact melt sheet would have been. And it's, uh, it varies, um, whether you're on the north side or the south side, between two and five kilometers thick. So think of a big boiling lava lake, um, two to five kilometers thick after the impact. Great answer. Um, I, there's a really great question in there uh, as well that's come up from Christopher. Is mining engineering a separate field of, of study from earth sciences? So uh, who'd like to take that? Mike or Doug? Go ahead. Yeah, Okay, yeah, it's a related field, but it is slightly different. In fact, at Lawrence University does have mining engineering program in the School of Engineering. Um, but mining engineer, they do uh, sort of work alongside the mining geologists, um, but they look at a lot of things, um, you know, stability uh, within the mine structure, um, some of the rock mechanics. And so it is, is very related because even in geology, you will study some of that as well. Um, but it is a it is a sort of a separate program where they have certain courses that they specialize on more on the engineering side than we would in, in the geology side. I'm just going to add, Christopher, uh, I used to work at an engineering firm and um, one of my colleagues there was a mining engineer. Amazing guy. Really loved him. Um, what he did is he had to build a team. Uh, and work with geologists and geoscientists so that they could give him the analysis of the rock structure that the engineering projects were needing to um, say tunnel into determine how they would move rock um, through um, how they would move equipment through the tunnels um, or shafts if you will um, so the mining engineers, if you think of it, they're the ones kind of helping to design mines, how to extract rock from mines, but much more mechanical, um, tons of math, tons, tons. Um, and they need what they basically take uh, information from geologists and apply that information and then move it into something that's a lot more structural and mechanical in the mining industry. So um, I hope that helps. Another really good question. Another example of 
something that might be slightly different. If you think about a mine, uh, quite deep levels, intricate um, tunneling, uh, they need to move a lot of air. So there has to be a lot of air movement, air handling. And when you look at the design of air handling and the capability of the air handling, you know, that would be something that traditionally a, a mining engineer or somebody with a mining engineer background might work on, but it's not something that a mining geologist look, look on. Um, you know, the mining geologists, when they go down there, they're commonly looking at the rocks, you know, trying to measure the geological structures, look at the rock types, try to trace the ore um, and so forth during the mining. So they're, they're looking more at the geology and the rocks instead of the infrastructure of the mine itself. Thanks. Um, see another question from Jill. <laughs> this is a great one. Um, how deep can they continue to find and mine nickel? Well, that's a really, really good question. And, uh, you know, everybody who lives in Sudbury is interested in that. Um, the, the short answer is quite simple. And, um, and, and that is, is that there's ore that goes down probably all of the 10 kilometers I mentioned. So it's there. The limit right now is uh, how deep they can mine and do it safely. And uh, what happens is, is that, and this is particularly true in Sudbury, unfortunately, is that there are a lot of uh, what we call far field tectonic stresses that are pushing on Sudbury. Um, I think you're sort of all have heard broadly of the concept of plate tectonics where the plates of the earth move around a little bit and the ocean floor spreads and makes new ocean crust and some of it goes down and so forth. But what happens is that puts stress on on, on the, 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 the continental plates and, and, and the Canadian shield is one of the oldest ones. And what happens is then when you mine, you're taking all the supporting structure away from stopping that stress and you get what are called rock bursts. And that means that the rock can just spontaneously explode because it's now got atmospheric pressure pushing on the side of the opening instead of having rock there to help keep everything in place. Um, and so the limit now, I mean, they're down, I forget exactly how deep Creighton is now. It's one of the deepest mines in the Western hemisphere. And it's, uh, it's down um, a couple kilometers uh, at least, uh, maybe a bit past that now. And, uh, you know, they, they, they do have ground control problems. Uh, and the same is true of some of the mines in, in Timmins too. And so there's maybe a practical limit of two and a half or three kilometers, I would say. Um, now, I'll give you a quick solution to that. So the quick solution, uh, which is quicker to think of than it is to actually um, um, execute is to flood the mine and mine it underwater. And then you've got water pushing back against the rocks and you can mine twice as deep. The problem with that is, is that you have to mine completely remotely and you have to have a way for all the communications with all the remote uh, robots, the remote mining equipment and so forth, to be able to communicate with the guy on top that's doing that. And they already do that, but they do it with cables and line of sight, little you know, internet things like we've got that don't pass through solid rock very well. So you have to develop other ways to do it. And uh, one way is some sort of optical transmission where you get flashes of light, uh, but then that requires line of sight and you can't have too much mud in the water. Um, or um, I've always thought that the best way to do it would be acoustically with little sounds that, that work, uh, you know, basically like a, like a bat does with its little small brain that, that we're not able to do with supercomputers yet. But eventually we'll be able to do that and then we'll be able to mine much more deeply. So just Mike, as, as you're talking about, uh, you know, the challenges with mining and it just kind of reminds me of how much um, earth science and geology has evolved. I mean, really, um, it's kind of a young science as sciences go, um, but it is an amazing, it's amazing how much it's evolving. And, you know, we think about hard rock mining mostly here in Sudbury, but, um, you know, one of our PH, no, one of our master's students, Keaton, he is Keaton's master's, right? He is uh, actually heading out on a ship and doing a deep sea expedition this month 
where they will be looking at what minerals are being spewed out of deep undersea volcanoes. So I just want uh, our, our attendees, we still have uh, a bunch online to like think about, you think about what your future could hold. How do you want to spend the rest of your life? If you would like it to include this kind of level of discovery um, and innovation and thinking about how to capture the earth's um, resources, how to protect the earth, um, there really, uh, there's really no limit. A um, couple more questions. We are going to do a hard stop um, like at 8.30. So um, just taking the questions in order. Um, Robin has asked if we have any toxic rocks around Sudbury and Manitoulin district. What comes to my mind is arsenopyrite. So there's arsenic in it and uh, it is uh, found around uh, an ancient gold mine that we have by Long Lake in Sudbury. So uh, that's the one that jumps to my mind. Yeah, and that's from very old gold mining. Yeah, so, you know, there, there are toxic uh, byproducts. Uh, they're very carefully handled uh, because there are trace amounts of arsenic and, and other uh, deleterious things. Not, I think arsenic's probably the worst, but those are managed very carefully. And, um, and uh, so, uh, you know, we don't get exposed to that um, at, at all, as far as I'm, I'm aware. Another I, I answer in the chat box there. Uh, maybe you wouldn't consider it toxic, but there are some radioactive rocks to the west of Sudbury. They're quite far west. Uh, they're in an area called Elliott Lake, um, and they used to be mined in, in the older days for, for uranium ores. Um, but that, you know, that's quite a ways away from Sudbury, and I don't believe it's being mined anymore. So it'll all be probably behind uh, fences so people can't access it and so forth um, to keep, you know, health concerns down. Uh, but that, that would be the most natural toxic related rocks in the area that I can think of. All right, Caleb is asking uh, basically uh, Mike, Doug, Lynn, Tobias and Connor, what is your favorite locally common mineral or rock? Pretty, uh, I don't know. What are your favorites guys? I uh, have a favorite mineral that is not so, not so common. It's perolite. So I'll just type it into the chat. Um, so it's, uh, it was found in a deposit that has uh, been mined out and it's called the Broken Hammer Deposit. So, and it was found in Sudbury originally and it's very valuable. If you find a good crystal for, of it, um, it's very, very deemed, um, by, uh, it's very, very um, wanted by collectors. So it's perolite. And then I also learned that we have a mineral called Laurentianite that our um, professor, Dr. Andy McDonald has helped discover and um, pretty much led the discovery or description of this mineral. Um, we also have a Sudbury, Sudburyite in, uh, in, in around Sudbury. So those would also be on my list, definitely. Yeah, Caleb's clarifying kind of, he's looking for your favorites that can be found locally, ones that are, ones that are, you know, you could uh, stumble upon here. Which, you know, this Sudbury ore is a bit of a, you. You'd have to go pretty deep, I'm guessing, to find this. Am I am I right, guys? Um, not not so deep. Not no. always so deep. No, um, I know of locations in around Copper Cliff that we, where you can find calcopyrite and um, pentlandite on the surface. Um, and uh, another one that came to my mind, a locally found rock that I wanted in my collection would be a garnet schist from the. Um, from the River Valley area. So there's a garnet mine that has uh, these available or um, accessible. Yeah, I don't know if I have a favorite mineral in the area, but I, I have lots of favorite rocks. I, I kind of like the Sudbury Brexia. You find it everywhere, but some places it's very fantastic. It occurs at the contacts between different rock types like granites and basalts. And, and there just makes a great, a great story. Uh, love taking students there in the field school. Um, and then east of town in the, uh, well, in the Grenville province. So if you drive east of Sudbury, you, you move into what's called the Grenville province, which is the core of an orogenic belt that was active around 1 billion years ago. 
And there, there are rocks that are quite high pressure rocks. Um, probably locally got up, you know, 11, 12 kilobars pressure and you find some equigites, they're quite far east. But even, you know, a 15 minute drive from Sudbury, you hit the garnet kyanite um, migmatites. So these are, these are rocks that were originally sediments, uh, sedimentary rocks, and they've been buried and heated up to probably about 700 degrees Celsius, and they start to partially melt and you have beautiful big garnets in them with big kyanites, big beautiful uh, blue kyanites. Um, and that's it's just right down the road, right off the Highway 17. Um, I guess I like the crystallized uh, impact rocks. So, um, and, and that includes the offset dikes. Uh, you can you can go out and go to the ends of the dikes and, and look at them, and there'll be little thin apophyses uh, that are like that that are basically glass uh, when the superheated melt squirted out. And then you trace that back into the the main part of the complex, and and that main impact melt sheet I mentioned that's two to five kilometers thick is actually uh, what we call differentiated. It crystallized uh, from the bottom up and from the top down. And when it crystallized, then the minerals that it makes are different than the composition of the melt. And so the composition of the melt changes a little bit. And then you crystallize different minerals. And so you get a, an actually a, a gross layering and changes in composition. And, um, and the rocks in, in, in that melt sheet cooled pretty slowly because it was thick. And so the rocks are coarse grained enough that you can actually see uh, the mineralogy change. And uh, one really good place to, to, to see that is along Highway 144 bypass um, from Creighton Mine up in toward the valley. And uh, you can just go along and, and see how the, the, the melt sheet changes as you go upward. You have to be careful where you park because it's a busy road. Um, but, um, but, but that's amazing. There's, there's no other place like it on earth where you can see an impact melt sheet exposed like that. All right, everyone. Well, I mean, um, I, think, I think the information shared today has been just amazing. And if you take home anything from this, uh, I hope you realize how much earth science can change your perspective on the world. Uh, fascinating. Oh, Caleb has one more question. Hit it, Caleb. I think maybe Caleb was really referring to the um, garnet mine that I was speaking about, and that was River Valley. So it's um, north of Sturgeon Falls. And I don't think we're talking about the uh, North Grenville area. Not think, I don't think it's the same area. Oh, right. So north of Sturgeon Falls. Uh, River Valley. Um, and some are asking online, um, how we'll make sure that they get their prizes. Um, and that is easy. Um, everybody who attended this webinar, I can collect your email address. So we will email you to collect the, you know, your mailing address and how we can make sure you get your Minecraft inspired mineral box to you. Um, and have a look in the chat. Um, Dr. Lesher is making himself available if you have additional questions. Um, and the same goes for all of us here tonight. Um, we are always available at HES um, at Laurentian.ca. I'll kind of, I'll share my screen whoop, once more so that you can get a, a look at that. Hey, I can talk to a Caleb. I think you might've been referring to what I said because I mentioned the Grenville province. And so I'm not sure exactly where North Grenville is, but the Grenville province was a large orogenic belt. It was active about 1.1 1 .1 to 950 million years ago. Um, you know, it was, it was the size of like the Himalayan mountain belt today. And that uh, Grenville belt runs all the way from uh, past um, Northeast Canada, and it runs all the way down through the US and all the way down into um, the Texas area. Um, so it was ab absolutely a massive, large continent-continent uh, continent collision orogenic belt, and it's exposed about 15-minute drive right outside of Sudbury. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, their great questions tonight, participating in trivia. Um, and just for spending the time with us this evening. Uh, once again, um, 
We are from the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences at Laurentian University, and um, we'd be really pleased to welcome you um, to engage with us. Uh, if you have further questions about our school, our programs, scholarships, how to apply, um, or even if you're still trying to decide um, if earth science or geology is a field that you want to pursue. Um, this is something we care about a lot, but we want to make sure that you have the best information possible to make the wisest decision for yourself. So I'm just seeing all the great feedback in the chat. Um, and thank you for that. If you have further feedback, we will send you a follow up email uh, asking for that and also giving a few more links uh, to information that can help you uh, in your journey if you're thinking about um, choosing a university uh, like Laurentian and a program like ours. So with that, it is 8.30, so good night, everyone. <laughs>